Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. A screen legend, an icon, whose film roles as the swashbuckling man of action and romantic lover remain unhealed. Such a man was Errol Flynn. Whether it was Zotto or Robin Hood or even the Blood Captain, he tried to live out this very image in his personal life, but unfortunately died a victim to his own debauchery. His fall from grace is the source of endless myths, many of which can now be unwrapped. Why Errol Flynn wanted to dominate women. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. One thing I always knew how to do was enjoy life. If I have any genius, it's a genius for living, said Errol Flynn in his biography, My Wicked Wicked Ways. For a man who claimed such a great appetite for living, he seemed curiously dedicated to self-destruction. Even those who knew him well were sometimes intrigued by his many contradictions. It was like meeting a beautiful statue and then coming up close and seeing all the cracks in the floors. Flynn's looks made him a natural in front of the audience and camera. He was carefully groomed for success by Hollywood. However, there were dark secrets in his past and he was reinvented by the studios who preferred to gloss over his misspent youth. They presented him as a native-born Irishman when in fact he was born in Tasmania. Among other characteristics that he displayed at school, a smart attitude and that continued throughout his life. Flynn's recklessness and love for danger were established early in his formative years, stealing from classmates, causing trouble at school, seducing local girls, or running away with the laundress's daughter. Errol had done it all. He would gain jobs just outside Australia and made ends meet based on his skills and education, which allowed him to work freely through the British Empire and various other colonies from the 1920s to 30s. Whilst working abroad and having to be an adventurer in his spare time, Flynn managed to get himself in acting and appeared in various popular films in Australia, after which he went to the United Kingdom to become a star in several other films that got him a paid acting credit. What most audiences loved about him was his I-don't-care personality and how adventurous he was on and off screen. The biggest hit he ever starred in, Murder in Monte Carlo, made all of the United Kingdom fawn over Flynn in 1935. After all these hits in the United Kingdom and Australia, he went on to work in the United States as an action hero in various movies. Now Hollywood had found their new leading actor for the new movies, and the Warner Brothers were the first studio ever to hire him. Hollywood was able to change the young, rugged Errol Flynn into a swashbuckling hero. The Adventures of Robin Hood, Dodge City, The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, and The Mask of Zorro were all major hits in Hollywood and Flynn was loved all over the United States. Meeting with world leaders, travelling around the globe, exploring continents for new movies, and living a lavish life with the world at his very feet. Some say that Errol Flynn did not have one rough or boring day in his entire life. The love of adventure and danger, the love of skating on thin ice, the love of doing something that was illegal with the possibility of getting away with it, this attitude that said, oh, I don't give a damn about anything. It all began in Australia on the island state of Tasmania, known for its rustic scenery, peculiar animals and, well, Errol Flynn. Theodore Thompson Flynn was a man of learning, a professor at Tasmania's only university, a biologist that was admirable and committed to research, Professor Flynn collected rare specimens for local museums. Flynn was born in 1909 to Professor Flynn and Lily Mary Young Flynn. Errol adored his mother and father greatly. He was a charming, handsome and rebellious little boy, always looking for ways to break the rules. Errol would go bone hunting with his father and idolised him. Errol's father was a womanizer himself, and whenever he got dissatisfied with his wife, there were plenty of other women ready to snuggle up to the handsome man and warm his bed. His mother herself sought refuge and comfort in the arms of other men, so to say his parents' relationship was strained was an understatement. Despite their constant absence that lasted long periods, Errol adored his family. 
He had a love-hate relationship with his mother all his life, stated daughter Deirdre Flynn. She would try to impose on him certain points of behaviour, and yet she didn't always follow them herself. Apparently she had a couple of affairs here and there, and this affected him. I think because he loved his father so much to have her cheat on his father. I think that affected his relationship with women all his life. This, of course, changed the way he looked at women throughout his life. He was suspicious of women and tried dominating them so they couldn't hurt him the way his mother did, including inflicting physical harm on him when he was young. He was a very engaging little boy, charming everyone around him. It came as no surprise that Flynn was always troublesome at school and was expelled from every single one he was enrolled in, from kindergarten to high school, but no doubt they remember him. He was very good-looking, tall, and female teachers were in love with him. He was a bit of a devil, stated a school friend. His formal education ended at 16 and he moved to Sydney to live with his maternal grandparents. He lived with a young society set and he was the most charming but also the poorest amongst them. Hard work was never his strong point and he made half-hearted attempts at getting employed. He soon realised he could survive on his looks alone and that is how he was discovered on a beach by a director and spent three weeks recording for a film. On the set of Australia's first talking picture, a legend was about to be born. Flynn auditioned for the main role and it left everyone unimpressed. His movie debut failed to impress, but he hardly cared, for he had other plans. From his childhood, Errol had watched the sailing ships with much fascination and dreamt of a life at sea. He badgered his family for loans and eventually had enough to buy a weather-beaten boat, the Sirocco. Though he had little sailing experience in 1930 with three friends, he set out on a dangerous voyage that was to last six months, from Sydney to New Guinea. Over the next four years, he made constant trips to New Guinea, and what started as an honest quest for a job turned dark fairly quickly. He was doing semi-illegal things. He seemed to be trading cobras, diamonds, rare bird feathers and tobacco. He was running a plantation, and he was even black slaving. Flynn left New Guinea with a little more to share for it than malaria and a dose of gonorrhea. He was about to leave for Sydney when something made him turn back and that something was about to change Flynn's life forever. A mysterious Austrian doctor named Hermann Urban. Together they toured the brothels and oaken dens of Asia, with Urban always encouraging Flynn's reckless side. Flynn now had dreams of becoming an actor, and there was only one place to be for that. Errol was 25 when he set for Hollywood, and he did not even have to get off the boat to make his mark. On the boat, he caught the eye of a successful French actress, Lily Demeter. The ravishing French woman was absolutely obsessed with him and was the one who'd help him start his career. Hollywood in the 1930s was a small incestuous town with a few connections to go a long way. Lily got Errol in at the gates at Warner Brothers. She would later claim credit for discovering Errol Flynn. Somehow the studio boss, Chad Warner, was convinced to take a huge risk in casting an unknown for the biggest film of the 30s, Captain Blood. It was said to be the biggest gamble ever, and Chad Warner was lucky with how things turned out. Flynn showed up at the premiere with his now wife Lily Demeter, who was in tears. When asked why, she stated, This is the day I have lost my husband. Over the next two years, Errol made half a dozen films and rocketed into the stratosphere as the biggest star of Hollywood. In their new home on Sunset Boulevard, Errol and Lily literally had their world at their feet. A perfect couple living the dream, but behind these perfect images, a typhoon was brewing. Flynn had started having affairs since the very beginning, and he'd wonder at times why he had married Lily. While their intimate life was amazing, the turbulence of their daily life shook them to the core. It is said she'd break plates or vases on his head whenever they'd argue. Whenever I think of Lily Demeter, I think about the hole she left in my head, Flynn said about his wife. To escape Lily, Errol exchanged one war zone for another, from New York to Europe and the Spanish War and then to Southern Asia. He went with his friend Herman, writing and photographing his way through Spain, and on his return he was once again the main lead in romantic films. Now richer than ever, Errol lived it large, while Flynn's career was rising, Lily's had been declining at a rapid pace, and his intense womanising left her sorrowful. 
After seven years of suffering, the couple separated. To escape all of this, he built a 10-acre estate on Mulholland Drive, a part farm, part playboy mansion, where he lived the ultimate bachelor life. During the span of a few years that transcended into the early 40s, Flynn wrote two books, through talk of the town parties, and got involved in scandals and smuggled a teenage Mexican girl across the border. During his trial in court regarding the assault of two minors, he noticed a young woman that went by the name Nora Eddington. Now the jury voted him as innocent and he won the case. Errol had always made it clear that he was not the marrying kind and when Nora fell pregnant after their first night, he delayed the inevitable for as long as he could. When she entered his house for the first time, she was flabbergasted to say the least. He was the most gorgeous human being I had ever seen, said Nora. He married her in the very last days of her pregnancy, almost as she was delivering in 1943, and they went on to have two children together. It was the very paradox of Errol Flynn that he would embody both playboy and a devoted father. It was very much a part of our lives growing up. He helped me with riding, taught me how to swim. I mean, I learnt so much just watching him, his daughter said. Soon America entered into the Second World War and Errol's sword was replaced with a gun and movies he starred in were dedicated to the war heroes. He felt ashamed that he was here play-fighting while there were actual men sacrificing their lives for the country and so he applied for every branch in the services but had been rejected. Warner Brothers had been hiding the fact that their star had tuberculosis. Errol's list of diseases included an enlarged heart, traces of malaria and chronic back problems. He relied on dangerous drugs like morphine and heroin to battle the pain. His dependence on these drugs grew every day. Nora could not bear to see him destroy himself with each passing day, and after six difficult years she left him in 1949. Drinking had a lot to do with it and other things that just added up and added up. I was very young and I couldn't take too much of a lot of things, Nora said. Makeup could no longer hide his difficult lifestyle and he had grown tired of Hollywood, so in 1950 he went into a self-proclaimed exile in Europe, a new life and a new wife. He married a young actress called Patrice Wymore and together they would live a gypsy existence. They had a daughter together three years later. In the last years of his life, Flynn moved as far away from Hollywood as he could, exploring places like India and living as recklessly and carelessly as he could. He signed everything over to his lawyer and his agent and he would be out of touch, out at sea, doing whatever he felt like. When he went back to America, he found out he had nothing left and that everyone had stolen everything from him. Millions of dollars had just disappeared. And that was not it. When he had missing alimony payments, Lily Demeter took away his beloved Mulholland farm and sold it, just to spite him. In a desperate attempt to make money, he was reduced to bad films and self-parody and he became what he had feared, a broken-down actor begging for money. The films were few and far between now and mostly forgettable. That was until Jack Warner threw him a lifeline and he made what was the greatest works of his career. His wandering eyes soon caught sight of Beverly Adland, a 16-year-old dancer, a beautiful girl and the happiest love of his life, perhaps. They were inseparable until his death two years later. At the age of 50, he was found dead by a heart attack by Beverly. His funeral was held in Los Angeles and was quite a muted affair. I remember going out on the balcony and crying and looking at the moon, just begging someone to not take him, Beverly said. And the industry he fought against so much finally claimed him as their own, and what he did perhaps no one today could achieve that height of fame or success in Hollywood. He left his legacy and his art behind, his wicked, wicked ways brought him to the top of the world and buried him six feet beneath the soil. No matter, he was the greatest star the silver screen had ever laid its eyes upon. Wasn't I a nasty character? Wasn't I horrible? If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Errol Flynn had a personal trauma behind why he chased women all the time. What was Catherine Hepburn's reason? How Catherine Hepburn jumped from man to man to get fame? Let's find out.